Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this paper. Uh, this paper is a joint work with uh, Stephen Schaefer, also at London Business School. And uh, we're doing currently doing a major revision, so uh, some of the results I present will not be in the paper. And uh, I do apologize to uh, Hajat for making his life a bit more difficult as a discussant. Uh. Now, uh, this paper is about the credit split puzzle. And uh, uh, the puzzle is the finding that if we kind of look at the uh, empirical spreads and uh, compare them with a uh, merchant type structural model, uh, constant uh, risk premium, constant uh, volatility, diffusive only uh, risk, then the spreads uh, in the data are higher than uh, those implied by, um, by the model. Uh, these graphs show uh, results from uh, Chen, Cullen, Dufresne and Goldstein in the 2009 paper. And what we see on the right figure is, uh, for example, that the 10-year triple B, triple A spread in the data, on average, uh, over periods of longer periods of time, it's maybe 100, 105 basis points, while the Merton model, uh, according to their results, uh, predict a spread of maybe 75 basis points. If we look at higher rating categories, uh, single A, double A, uh, we find that uh, the Merton model can explain a, a, an even smaller fraction of uh, uh, the empirical spread. Now on the left hand side we can see for example it gets worse uh, for triple B, triple A, the four year spread where the empirical spread is uh, 105 basis points and that implied by uh, the Merton model is around uh, 50, 55. So that's the puzzle. Uh, now how has these, uh, the Merton model and uh, uh, different flavors of the Merton model been tested? Now most of the papers finding a credit spread puzzle, uh, they test the um, the model using a representative firm, which means that uh, it's an average firm within a rating category, say an average triple B firm with an average triple B leverage ratio and other average parameters. Now most often uh, this representative firm is then fitted to historical default frequencies. Uh, so, so they are tied down by uh, forcing them to match the default frequency and, and all of these papers, they find a significant credit split puzzle. Now there is a slightly smaller literature that looks at individual firms. Uh, there's, there, there are some papers mentioned here. Now their approach is somewhat different. Uh, they don't use a representative firm. Uh, they fit uh, individual firms. Um, but they don't fit to historical default frequencies. So, so, so th that is uh, merely a more, more of a pricing exercise. Now all those uh, using a representative firm, they find a significant credit spread puzzle. The evidence is a bit more mixed using individual firms. It, it, it becomes very dependent on uh, parameters. But while most of them find that uh, these models underpredict, uh, there are also cases where uh, uh, these papers find uh, that some of these models actually fit the data well or even overpredict. Now, what we do in this paper is that we, 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 we take a step back and uh, uh, we look at the realized default frequencies. Uh, and, and what we find uh, is that the exposed realized default rates when measured over shorter periods of time, and by shorter periods that's around 30 years, they are, they are they're quite noisy. And, uh, uh, and, and particularly they're skewed. And, and particularly the skewness is problematic because what this means is that most of the time we're going to see uh, realized default rates that are lower than uh, extended default probabilities. So, uh, so, so what we then show is that, well, when we use a long time series of default rates, 80, 90 years, the puzzle largely disappears. What we also do is that we, we, we document uh, convexity biases in, in parts of the literature. Now, this, this, this convexity bias is well known in the literature, but what we, what we document is that it, it has more severe co consequences uh, uh, when using a representative firm than previously thought. Finally, in the final part, part of the paper, we, we, we test the Merton model uh, and we combine two approaches in the literature, namely using individual bond data while at the same time forcing uh, the model to fit the history of default rates, where the history is a long uh, time series of default rates. And what we find when doing this is that we find that actually this, the Merton model does a surprisingly good job in pricing long-term investment grade bonds relative to each other, it's longer maturities while we still find somewhat of a puzzle for short maturities. Okay. Now, here's the uh, basics of the Merton model. Uh, 
the, asset, uh, the assets of the firm follows a geometric bound in motion, uh, where delta is a payout rate to both debt and equity holders. There's constant uh, asset volatility, and uh, under the historical measure, there is an asset risk premium uh, in the drift. At time zero, the uh, firm issues, uh, has issued two claims. It has issued equity, and then it issued a zero coupon bond maturing at time capital T. Then as time passes, uh, um, firm value changes, and at time capital to T, if uh, firm value is above the uh, face value of debt, debt holders get the money back, otherwise uh, the firm defaults, and uh, debt holders only get a fraction back, and here we use the standard assumption uh, in the literature, a departure from the pure merchant model, that in this case bondholders see receive a recovery of uh, 49%, which is consistent with historical uh, recovery rates. Now, when looking at historical default rates, uh, they play a very crucial role in the literature. Uh, because most of these studies, they calibrate to these historical default rates. For example, Chen, Colin, Dufresne, and Goldstein, and, and Chen, uh, they use a 10-year cumulative triple B default frequency of 4.89%, which is based on data, uh, data for Moody's from 70 to 2001. Other papers, use very similar uh, default frequencies uh, based on slightly different periods, but again, based on Moody's data. Now, the assumption here is that the exposed default rate proxies well for extended default <coughs> probability. And we test this assumption in a simulation study. And in a sense, our simulation study is a kind of a, a, a simple version of a similar simulation study in uh, uh, Harshad's paper with uh, Kuhn and Srebrenikov in the 2007 paper. and. Uh, Particularly what we do is we, we s repeatedly simulate 30 years of data and then we calculate average 10-year triple B default rates in each of these simulations. And the way we set up the simulation is guided by the way that Moody's, they calculate these historical default rates. So how do they calculate them? Well, in order to get the 4.89%, uh, uh, Moody's, they, uh, uh, they set up a cohort of triple B firms uh, in 1970. And then they track how many of those firms uh, defaulted within the next 10 years. That's the realized default frequencies of uh, the 70 cohort. Then they create a new cohort in 71, and then they track the default frequencies of those uh, within the next 10 years. And they do that for uh, 21 years, and then they calculate the average uh, default frequency uh, across all these cohorts. And that's how they arrive at the 4.89%. So here's what you do in the simulation setup. We assume that uh, uh, we have a year one cohort of uh, 1,000 identical firms in an index. We ignore any heterogeneity, uh, so we just have identical firms. Then we simulate and we track those uh, firms for the next 10 years. And uh, uh, we calculate the default frequencies of, uh, of those uh, 1,000 firms. Then in year two, we set up a new cohort of 1,000 identical firms. Uh, identical in the sense that they're identical to each other and they're identical when they enter the index in year two as those firms entering the uh, index at year one, at year one. Uh, so then we again track the 10-year default frequency of this cohort by simulation, and we do this for 20 years, and then we calculate the average 10-year default frequencies uh, for that economy. And then we repeat this simulation 100,000 times. Now, in the simulation, there, there, there's, there's only two parameters. There's uh, the default probability, and there's a correlation structure. And uh, here we can simply, instead of looking at the underlying parameters of the firm, uh, we simply specify it in terms of a uh, constant C, where we can simply, for any given underlying parameters, <coughs> that give rise to a constant C, which then give rise to a default probability. Namely, the probability that the Wiener process driving uh, the asset volatility is below this constant. Now, uh, the convenient thing is that we can just choose this uh, C such that the default probability is 4.89%. The crucial thing here is uh, that we introduce systematic risk by assuming that the Wiener process driving uh, asset value depends on an idiosyncratic part uh, and a systematic part. And uh, we assume a uh, correlation structure of 25%, uh, which is based on Kramer, Sleason, and Meinhardt, who find that the pairwise equity correlation is uh, 25.4% uh, for a set of firms. And what this means is that every firm, they share the common process and then they have an idiosyncratic component. Um, and this correlation, uh, this uh, common process creates correlations in two ways. 
first. If there are two firms in the same index, this means that the correlation is 25%. If we have, uh, say, a firm in the year one cohort and a firm in year two cohort, what this means is that they share the uh, uh, common process for nine years, so they have a correlation which is slightly less than 25%. And of course, if two firms they don't overlap in time, the correlation is zero. Now here are the simulation results. What this shows is, first of all, we have the black line, and uh, that's the expanded default probability in, the, in every of these simulated economies of 30 years. So that is 4.89%, because that's the default probability of every one of these firms when they enter the index. Now, what we see from the distribution of realized default rates is two things. The first is that this, the confidence band around the uh, realized default rate, it's large. I mean, a 95% confidence band would go from 0.7% to uh, almost 15%. So there's huge uncertainty, and the realized default rate might be very different from the extended default probability. This conclusion is similar to what uh, Hajat showed in his paper with uh, Kuhn and Strevelayev. Now, the other very interesting uh, thing when we look at this, uh, these uh, real default rates is that this distribution is quite skewed. So the value of a realized default rate that we are going to observe most often is close to half of the ex ante default probability. So most of the time, if there's not a negative shock, very negative shock to the economy during those 30 years, then the realized default rate is going to be below the extended default probability, and we would perceive that there was a credit spread puzzle, because they perceived too low relative to the spreads. So that's two crucial things, that the confidence band is wide and the, the distribution is very skewed. And, and by the way, why is it so wide? Well, if you look at 10-year default uh, uh, rates, essentially, over a 30-year period, essentially we only have three truly independent observations. Now, we could increase the number of uh, years in the economy. So uh, this shows the uh, simulated distribution if we use 90 years of data. And, and of course, not surprisingly, if you have more data, uh, the confidence band gets tighter. But what is also interesting is that the, the distribution gets more uh, symmetric and more centered around the extended default probability. So what we take away from uh, this simulation exercise is that it is very important to look to use a long data series of default rates because otherwise, most likely, we're going to see a default uh, rate which is lower than the extended default probability, and there's high standard error on that. Okay, now if, if uh, we go back to the uh, graph on the first slide, then remember that in the Chen Cullen and Dufresne, uh, Dufresne uh, paper, they use default rates based on Moody's data from 70 to 2001. But Moody's, they, they published default rates going back from 20. So if we, instead of using 31 years of data, we use 81 years of data uh, for the default rates, the result looks like this. Because on average, default rates were higher in the early period. So once we use default rates for the long period, actually the credit spread puzzle to a large extent disappears. And by the way, was the question here arises, was the economy uh, materially different in the early period? Well, I mean, we, 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 we can look at the long-term triple B, triple A spreads uh, published by Moody's on Fed, Fed's webpage. And if we look at the uh, average spread over the long period, it's 121 basis points, while over the short period, it's 110 basis points, which are similar. These, does, these spreads include callable bonds, so that messes up things slightly. But on average, it seems like uh, they're, they're pretty similar. Chen Cullen and Friend and Goldstein also show that sharp ratios in the long period and short periods, uh, they are very similar. Okay, now there are also a few studies that, uh, that don't use default rates, still use a representative firm, but don't calibrate them to default rates, but calibrate the parameters of this representative firm. So this might be viewed as evidence that, uh, uh, it's kind of evidence independent of uh, noisy default rates that there is a credit spread puzzle. But this approach suffers from a convexity bias. And, and, and this convexity bias is, is, is well known. 
Alexander David has a paper about that. And again, uh, my discussion also has a paper about that. So, so we know that there's a, this convexity bias. But what we show is that this convexity bias feeds in the way uh, uh, these models are used in more severe ways than previously thought. Here's our illustration of the convexity bias. Uh, we have a firm that, uh, uh, where all firms have the same parameters, except they have different leverage ratios on the x-axis. And uh, here we see that uh, the spread is highly convex in the leverage ratio. So if you have a high levered firm and a low levered firm and take the average spread, it's, it's much higher than uh, taking a representative firm and the average leverage and calculate the spread. Um, so the difference between the average spread and the spread of the average is the convexity bias. Now, in order to uh, illustrate how this convexity bias uh, affects results, we do a simple simulation. So in the simulation, we have 100,000 firms. They have identical parameters, all the 100,000 firms. They only differ in the leverage ratio. So we simulate the leverage ratio of all these firms and let them have a mean of 37% uh, and a standard deviation of 17%. This, these are kind of typical triple B firms. Now the standard deviation of 17% we have arrived at by simply looking at the empirical standard deviation of uh, leverage ratios of triple B firms over a long period of time. Why do they have the different leverage ratios uh, in the data? Well, first of all, cross-sectionally, at any given point of time, uh, there's quite a variation in uh, leverage ratios uh, uh, within a given rating category. And over time, the leverage ratio of, say, uh, on average of triple B firms also varies. Now, if we take these 100,000 firms that only differ in the leverage ratio, and they have one important parameter, they have an asset volatility of 24%. If we, for each of those uh, firms, we calculate the term structure of corporate bond spreads by repeatedly pricing a, a, a zero coupon bond with different maturities, and then we take the average uh, term structures of those uh, 100, 100,000 firms, we get the black line here. Now, if we instead use the uh, representative firm uh, approach uh, and not fit to historical default frequency or default probabilities, uh, as in Leland and uh, McQuaid, then we take uh, the average leverage ratio and uh, use that for a representative firm and uh, then predict the credit spread and uh, we arrive at this. And, and, and because of the convexity bias, there's a, there's a downward bias in the spread. This is, this is well known, but what is interesting here is that the bias gets more severe as the bond maturity decreases. So at very short horizons, it's huge. At longer horizons, it's more modest. Now, that's going to be important in, in, in just a moment. Now, the, the argument in the literature why, because this convexity bias is known, the argument why it's safe to ignore is, is put forth by, say, Huang and Huang and Chin, Colin, Dufresne, Goldstein, and saying, well, once you fit to historical default frequencies, this convexity bias is, is countered, and, and we can ignore it when using a representative firm. Why? Well. Because there's a downward bias when using a representative firm when predicting spreads, but there's also a downward bias when predicting default probabilities. So when using a representative firm, when we calibrate that and force it to uh, fit historical default frequencies, and typically this is done by leaving the asset volatility as a free parameter that we can imply out, well, there's a downward bias when predicting uh, default probabilities, how do we counter that? Well, by having a too high asset volatility. Then we predict spreads. And we have a too high asset vol volatility leading to a too high spread. But then there's a downward bias, so these two roughly cancel out. So that's an argument why we can use a representative firm and ignore the convexity bias. Now, if we do that, and we do this by calculating the 10-year default probability of each of these 100,000 firms, and then we take the average, and then we take the average leverage, and for a representative firm, simply imply out the asset volatility that makes that representative firm fit the uh, default probability. We get a term structure for this uh, uh, representative firm that looks like the red line. Now, there are several interesting aspects here. The first is, yes, it, there's not a downward bias anymore when we predict the 10-year spread. So remember here, we fit to 10-year default probabilities and predict 10-year spread. 
So the download bias is count countered. In fact, there's a slight upward bias. Uh, now, if you look here, the uh, asset volatility now is biased. So that because the asset volatility is now 25.4%, because we need to raise the asset volatility to counter the convexity bias. So what we are going to have here is a biased asset volatility. What we are also seeing is that, well, the, as we predict, as we look at credit spreads at short horizons for this representative firm, the convexity bias reappears. Why? Well, because we fit to 10-year default probabilities. And, and if we predict the spread at the 10-year horizon, roughly the biases are of the same magnitude. But if we predict spreads at shorter horizons, the bias is, shorter, is stronger at shorter horizons, so the bias reappears because now the biases, they don't cancel out anymore. So this is the approach taken by some papers like Kramer, Sleason, and Meinhardt, and Sang, Su, and Su, that fit to the uh, default probability at a long horizon, or the realized default frequency, and then predict the whole term structure and spreads. And what we see here is that using a representative firm approach, that is not meaningful because the convexity bias is going to reappear and be huge again at shorter maturities. Of course, we could then just fit uh, to the five-year default probability and then uh, uh, again for a representative firm approach. And this illustrates, well, then roughly we're going to predict the five-year spread correctly, but the spreads at other maturities are going to be off. And if we do it at the five-year horizon, look here, the, uh, the uh, implied asset volatility is even higher because the bias at shorter maturities is stronger, so it needs to be higher to counter this stronger uh, convexity bias. We could also do it for the one-year horizon, and, and, and of course the, or the spread is very high at longer maturities then. And what is interesting here is then the implied asset volatility is 38%. So the fact, and this is a well-established uh, finding in the literature that if, if we take a standard Merton model and fit it to one-year default, uh, realized default frequencies, the implied asset volatility is huge. And, and, and this, this is generally regarded as evidence that the Merton model fails. But what we see here is that, well, it's not clear because uh, when using a representative firm, I mean, you, you are, because of the convexity bias, you are going to have a hugely biased asset volatility at short horizons. Because remember, all of these firms, they have an asset volatility of 24%. So the conclusion from this is two things. First of all, it's very problematic to predict the term structure of credit spreads when using the representative firm approach. And secondly, when using this representative firm approach, one has to live with a biased asset volatility or other parameters with, if other parameters are implied out because of the convexity effect. Okay. So what we do in the final part of the paper is uh, we test the model using uh, more recent data. And uh, here it's slightly different from, uh, uh, from what is in the paper, but uh, here we use daily corporate bond quotes from Merrill Lynch from 1997 uh, to 2012. We use only standard bonds, only bonds issued by industrial firms, no call options, no covenants, and so forth. And, and, and then we estimate, uh, for each of these uh, uh, bond codes, we estimate a daily leverage, uh, a payout rate, and an asset volatility implied out from the equitable volatility using crisp compass stat. Now, the way we uh, uh, then calibrate the model is a new approach where we allow for the heterogeneity in firms, but at the same time, we, we want to tie our hands down and fit to historical default frequencies. Now, the way we do it is, in the, uh, in the example I showed you earlier, the firm defaults if uh, uh, firm value is below face value of debt. Now, there's some debate in the literature whether it's a face value of debt or whether it's lower, and uh, we simply leave the default boundary as a uh, free parameter. And then we find, we find the default boundary that gives us uh, the best fit to historical default frequencies. And importantly, using default frequencies for a longer period. So in our sample, we use the uh, early period, the uh, 97, 2007, to calibrate this default boundary. And uh, we use a Sharpe ratio of 0.22. Uh, again, 
taken from Chin, Colin, Dufresne, and Goldstein. And then we, for, for investment grade firms, uh, uh, for each of the investment grade rating categories, we calculate the average default probability implied by the model for one to 10 year default, uh, for one to 10 year horizons. And then we uh, minimize the mean squared errors. And uh, what we find is that once we have minimized the squared errors between uh, model implied and uh, historical default rates, we find a boundary that is 98% of the face value of debt. So, so we simply set, uh, for simplicity, the boundary to the face value of debt. When we do this, we get this result. Uh, so what we do here is, uh, for each month in the sample, we, uh, we look at all the bonds that have a maturity uh, between 4 and 30 years. We bundle them together to get uh, uh, kind of a bigger sample for any given month. And uh, for any triple B bond uh, for maturity between 4 and 30 years, uh, we take the yield, uh, the actual yield, and then we calculate the average across a month of all these yields. We do the same for triple A, and then we have the average triple B, triple A uh, spread for the, for the data, and we have it for the model as well. We calculate that for the model as well. Now remember, uh, in the calibration, we don't use the uh, empirical spreads in any way. So, uh, so we haven't used those in the calibration of the model. But what we see here is that overall, the, uh, the Merton model does a surprisingly good job of not only matching the average level of uh, uh, the triple B, triple A spread, but also does a fairly decent job in matching the time series variation. So in a sense, this is a quite a stronger test than uh, previous in the literature where, where uh, uh, papers looked at the average uh, spreads. But here we, we actually find that, by and large, it does a, a quite good job in capturing the time series variation of spread. There is a period uh, just before the crisis where model spreads were lower than actual spreads. Uh, but, uh, but apart from that, it does a fairly good job. Now, if we look at the uh, shorter horizons, so we can repeat the same, uh, we can repeat the same uh, procedure, except now, instead of looking at uh, long-term bonds, four to 30 years, we look at uh, short-term bonds, maturities between four and zero uh, years, we see a slightly different picture. And, um, and what we see is that for short-term B triple A spreads, there is an issue because what we see is most of the time the uh, Merton model does underpredict the triple B, triple A spread. Um, so, uh, although it seems to do surprisingly well during the crisis, uh, for most of the period it's, it, it's significantly lower than uh, the actual spreads. So, what this suggests is that there is an issue with, um, with the Merton model uh, pricing uh, corporate bonds at uh, investment grade corporate bonds at short maturities. But the previous graph showed that for long maturities, it actually does a surprisingly good job. Now, just, just, just one, uh, one comment, uh, because here I'm, I'm essentially, or here we are just looking at spreads relative to each other in investment grade bonds. So, so what, what I've shown you here is completely separated uh, spreads relative to the risk free rate, because there is an important uh, but unsettled kind of discussion about what to use as risk free rates, the treasury bonds or the swap rates. And, uh, and in order not to confuse uh, uh, this discussion with, uh, the, with kind of whether it depends on the risk free rate or not, uh, we, we are simply looking at spreads relative to each other. So the conclusion is that the Merton model, at least for long term spreads, uh, uh, prices these uh, investment grade bonds very well relative to each other. Now, so, uh, so just to conclude. What uh, we find here in, the, in, in this paper is that the previous literature using a representative firm approach, all finding a severe credit spread puzzle, suffers from one of two of the following points. First of all, there's low statistical power because of the calibration to historical default frequencies when calculated over short periods of time. Uh, and, and, and more severely, because this, this, this in a sense has been shown before, uh, but more severely, the, uh, it's a very skewed distribution. So most often we are going to see a credit spread puzzle in, in kind of short periods of uh, time. Then we show uh, that there are biases due to using this representative firm approach because of this convexity bias. And what we've shown is that it, it kind of, it feeds in more than uh, previously uh, thought in the literature. 
And, and, and what we're finding is once we use a long history of fold rates and avoid the convexity bias, we find that the Martin model does a surprisingly good job in pricing long-term investment-grade corporate bonds, both on average and in time series.